This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hugh McGuire. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 11. Lucy Wisterna's Diary. 12 September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsling. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me he was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep so often of late, the pain of sleeplessness, or the pain of the fear of sleep, and with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep, and lying like Ophelia in the play, with virgin crants and maiden struments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary, 13 September Called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing, as usual, up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colors, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westerna, coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, you will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she replied, You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How do you mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that the heavy odor would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a f little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen gray. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair 
and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally he sat down on a chair, and putting his hands before his face began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said, what have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still? Send down from the pagan world of old that such things must be in such a way. This poor mother, all unknowing, and all for the best as she think, does such thing as lose her daughter body and soul, and we must not tell her. We must not even warn her, for she die, then both die. Oh, how we are beset. How are all the powers of devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said, come! We must see and act. Devils are no devils. Or all the devils at once, it matters not. We must fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again I drew the blind, whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on a little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity, and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said. Today you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic. Again some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsig recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westernra, that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him. That the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their order was part of the system of the cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and would send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westernra's Diary 17 September Four Days and Nights of Peace I'm getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and had just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make the present distress more poignant and then long spells of oblivion, and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to so frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. 
I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Van Helsing is going away, and he has to be for a day in Amsterdam. But I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake and dear Arthur's, for all our friends have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again, although the boughs or bats or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. The Pall Mall Gazette, 18 September The Escaped Wolf, Perilous Adventure of Our Interviewer Interview with the Keeper in the Zoological Gardens After many inquiries and almost as many refusals, and perpetually using the words Pall Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the Zoological Gardens in which the Wolf Department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the Elephant House, and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly, and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over, and we were all satisfied. Then, when the table was cleared, and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me for refusing to talk of professional subjects afore meals. I gives the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas in all our section their tea afore I begins to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions, I queried, wishful to get him into a talkative humor. Hitting of them over the head with a pole is one way. Scratching of their ears is another. When gents as is flush wants a bit of shore for their gals. I don't so much mind the fust. The hitting of the pole part afore I chucks in their dinner. But I awaits till they've had their sherry and quaffy, so to speak, afore I tries on with the ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same nature in us as in them there animals. Here's you a-coming and arskin of me questions about my business. And I, that grump-like, that only for your bloomin' arf quid, I'd a seen you blowed fust before I'd answer. Now even when you arsk me, me sarcastic-like, if I'd like you to ask the superintendent if you might ask me questions. Without offence, did I tell you to go to hell? You did. And when you said you'd report me for using obscene language that was hitting me over the head. But the arf quid made that all right. I weren't a going to fight, so I waited for the food, and did with my all as the wolves and lions and tigers does. But lor love your art. Now that the old woman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me and rinsed me out with her bloomin' old teapot, and I've lit a hop. You may scratch my ears for all you're worth, and won't even get a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're a-coming at. That ear escaped wolf. Exactly. I want you to give me your view of it. Just tell me how it happened, and when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair will end. All right, Governor. This ear's about the old story. That air wolf, what we call Bersiker, was one of three grey ones that come from Norway to Jamrocks, which we bought off him four year ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf. They never gave no trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for one to get out, nor any other animal in the place. But there you can't trust wolves no more, nor women. Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Mrs. Tom with a cheery laugh. He's got mind in the animalies so long that blessed if he ain't like an old wolf himself. But there ain't no arm in him. 
Well, sir, it was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first heard my disturbance. I was making up a litter with the monkey house for a young puma which was ill. But when I heard the yelping and owling, I came some way straight. There was Bearsicker, a tearin' like a mad thing at the bars if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man, a tall, thin chap with a nook nose and a pointed beard, with a few white hairs running through it. He had a hard, cold look and red eyes, and I took a sort of mislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him that was irritating at. He had white kid gloves on, his hands, and he pointed out to the animalies, to me and says, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the airs as he give himself. He didn't get angry, as I hoped he would, but he smiled a kind of insolent smile with a mouth full of white, sharp teeth. Oh, no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh, yes, they would, says I, a imitatin' of him. They always like a bone or two to clean their teeth on about tea time, which you is a bag full. Well, it was an odd thing, but when the animalies sees us a-talkin', they lay down. And when I went over to Bearsicker, he let me stroke his ears same as ever. That there man came over and blessed, but if he didn't put his hand and stroke the old wolf's ears too. I care, says I. Bersiker is quick. Never mind, he says. I'm used to him. Are you in the business yourself? I says, taking off my hat. For a man what trades in wolves, and setter, is a good friend to keepers. No, says he. Not exactly in the business. But I have made pets of several. And with that he lifts his at, as polite as a lord, and walks away. Old Bersicker kept a looking after him till he was out of sight, and then went and lay down in a corner, and wouldn't come out the whole evening. Well, last night, so soon as the moon was up, the wolves here began all a howling. There weren't nothing for him to howl at. There weren't no one near, except someone that was evidently a calling a dog somewheres out back of the gardenings, in the park road. Once or twice I went out to see that all was all right, and it was. And then the island stopped. Just before twelve o'clock I just took a look round before turning in and bust me, but when I came opposite the old bearsicker's cage, I see the rails broken and twisted about the cage and empty. And that's all I know for certain. Did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was a coming home about that time from Armony. When he sees a big grey dog a coming out through the gardening edges, at least so he says, I don't give much for it myself. For if he did, he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home. And it was only after the escape of the wolf that was made known. And we been up all night a hunting of the park for bearsicker, that he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that the harmony got in his head. Now, Mister Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said with a suspicious sort of modesty. I think I can. But I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly, I shall. If a man like you, who knows the animals from experience, can't hazard a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I accounts for it this way. It seems to me that their wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had done some service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in badinage with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart. So I said, 
Now Mr. Builder will consider that first half-sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Right you are, sir, he said briskly. You'll excuse me, I know, for a chaffin' of ye. But the old woman here winked at me, which was as much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this, that there wolf is hiding of somewheres. The gardener what didn't remember said he was a galloping northward faster than a horse could go, but I don't believe him, for you see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more, no dogs does. They not being built that way. Wolves is fine things in a storybook, and I dare say when they gets in packs and does be chivying something that's more afeard than they is, they can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But, Lord bless you, in real life a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever or bold as a good dog, and not half a quarter so much fight in him. This one ain't been used to fightin'. Or even providing for himself. More like he's somewhere round the park a hiding than the shivering of, and if he thinks at all, wondering where he's to get his breakfast from. Or maybe he's got down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye, won't some cook get a rum start when she sees his green eyes a shining at her out of the dark? If he can't get food, he's bound to look for it, and mayhap he may chance to light on a butcher's shop in time. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes out a walk in her arf with a soldier leaving the infant in the perambulator, well, then I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one baby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. "'God bless me,' he said, "'if there ain't old Bearsicker come back by hisself.' He went to the door and opened it, a most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of profound durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea. After all, however, there is nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf that for a half-day had paralyzed London and set all the children in town shivering in their shoes was there in a sort of penitent mood, and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent said, there, I knew the poor old chap would get back into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here's his head all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-getting over some bloomin' wall or other. It's a shime that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This here's what comes of it. Come along, Beresicker. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fatted calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary, 17 September I was engaged after dinner in my study, posting up my books, which through press of other works, and the many visits to Lucy had fallen sadly into arrear. Suddenly the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient, with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck for such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's notice he made straight at me. He had a dinner-knife in his hand, 
and as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for before I could get my balance he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right hand, and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort, and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in, and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up, like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, The blood is the life! The blood is the life! I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good. And then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily, Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forego my sleep. Tonight I could not well do without it. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given, delivered late by twenty-two hours. 17 September. Stop. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. Stop. If not watching all the time, frequently visit and see that flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Stop. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Stop. Dr. Seward's Diary. 18 September. Just off train to London, the arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know by bitter experience what may happen in a night. Of course it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take the cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westernra. 17 September, night. I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely enough strength to write. But it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking off the cliff at Whitby, when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to sleep, but I could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come then when I did not want it. So, as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake Mother, and so closed my door again. Then outside in the shrubbery I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat, which had evidently been buffering its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened and my mother looked in. Seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, she came in and sat by me. She said to me, even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me. So she came into bed, 
and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her and at last succeeded and she lay quiet, but I could hear her poor heart still beating terribly. After a while there was a howl again out in the shrubbery, and shortly after there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great gaunt gray wolf. Mother cried out in a fright and struggled up into a sitting posture, and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing around my neck, and tore it away from me. For a second or two, she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all around seemed to spin around. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seems to come blowing in through the broken window and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that the travelers describe when there is a simoon in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down, and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near, a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all round the neighborhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seeming just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sound seemed to have awakened the maids, too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what had happened and what it was that lay over me in the bed, they screamed. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed, too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother and laid her, covered up with a sheet, on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and each have a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maids shrieked and then went in a body to the dining room, and I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. When they were there, I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them. And besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer. So I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer acrid smell about. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum. And looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle, which Mother's doctor uses for her, oh, did use, was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her. I am alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead. I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks floating and circling in the draft from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God, shield me from harm this night.
I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone, it is time I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. End of chapter 11